Hello everybody, I'm Ingram from Alquan, a great pleasure to have you here with me today. And in today's video, I'll be talking about a very popular instrument both among retail and professional traders, and that is options. Now for those of you who have no experience in options, it can be a little complicated, right? but not to worry, after this video, you should have a better idea of what it is and how it works. So as usual, what I'll be covering in this introductory video are going through some basic questions regarding options, like what are options, how does options work, what are options used for, what are the reasons involved right, when you trade in options, and finally, how do you go about trading options. Alright, ready? Let's go. First question, what are options? Now, options is a derivative contract. What it means is that it derives its value from another underlying asset, maybe such as a stock, a bond, or a commodity or something else. And at its most basic level, we can define it as a contract that gives you the following. Okay, it gives you the right, but not the obligation, to buy or sell a particular security at an agreed price, either up to or on an expiration date itself. And you'll see more details on this later. Now you can trade standardized option contracts on the exchanges. And options can also be traded over the counter where these contracts can then be customized, right, to suit the needs of the different counterparties involved. Okay? And like I mentioned before, options are contracts written on another underlying asset. And this asset can span a wide range, right? It can be a stock, it can be a bond, it can be commodities, forex, or even futures, forwards and swaps. Right? Forwards and swaps are traded mostly by institutions, so some of you may not have heard of them. Okay, and but for this particular video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to only concentrate talking about options on stocks. But the broad idea is the same. And then finally, options, right, can also be classified into different types and styles. And at the most fundamental level, options can be classified into what we call call options and put options. There's two types of options. And within, right, each option itself, they can be further segregated by style, whether it's an American style option or an European style option. And don't get the wrong idea, right? The styles I'm talking about here got nothing to do with fashion. So we'll cover what it means shortly. Now let's talk a little bit more about the different styles and uh, option types over here. Now a call option is an option that gives you the right to buy. While a put option, on the other hand, gives you the right to sell. So the difference is very clear cut between the two. One is to buy and the other is to sell. And in terms of styles, an American style option allows you to exercise that right to buy or sell anytime as long as the option has not expired. Okay? While an European option, on the other hand, is more restrictive and it only allows you to exercise the right to buy or sell on the expiration date itself. To give you an idea, options on US stocks and ETFs or your exchange trader funds are typically American options, while those on indices such as your S&P 500 and index futures are European options. Now let's go through some of the important terms defined within an options contract. Now the first is the underlying. All options have an underlying from which the value is derived. And in this example, we have an option on SPY. So SPY is the S&P 500 exchange trader fund. And technically, it is considered a stock. Right next is what we call the strike price. So the strike price is the agreed price of which you will buy or sell SPY when the option is exercised, depending, of course, on whether it is a call or the put that we're talking about here. Then we have the expiration date. This is straightforward. This is simply the date on which the option will expire. And of course, we also have the quota, uh, the quota price of the option. And note, the standard for each option contract is for 100 shares of the underlying stock. But the prices you see quoted on the broker screen are usually for just one share. So to get what you need to pay, you need to multiply the amount you see by 100. Right, so in this case, the total cash you need to fork out to purchase one option contract on SPY is $2,262. Then we have the option type, and this is a call option. So it means it gives you the right to buy SPY at a strike price when you exercise it. And next is the option style. This is an American style option, which means you have the flexibility to exercise it anytime all the way up to is expiry. And lastly, we have what they call the settlement method. So settlement method has usually two types. One is called a physical delivery, and the second type is called a cash settlement method. So most options on stocks require physical delivery. That means when the option is exercised, you actually either have to deliver the stocks or to take receipt of it. All right, options on indices 
and index futures on the other hand are usually cash settled so that means only the net profit and loss in cash are settled between the buyer and seller second question how do options work now the easy way to look at options is to think of it like an insurance so the buyer of an option is like paying premiums to the seller and the buyer only gets paid by the seller when the event is triggered so if you are buying a call that means the price of the underlying security got to rise above the strike and if it is a put then the price of the underlying security got to go below the strike so we'll look at some examples later on so they have a better idea of what this is but the main point here is that if the event does not happen within the entire period all the way up to the expiry date then basically the buyer loses the premium and the seller gets to keep it so does this look at how the accident insurance plan works to you now let's look at a few scenarios to understand how call and put work from both the option seller and the option buyer's perspective so in this scenario here you think the price of SPY will rise. So you bought a call option on SPY for $2,262. And this option has a strike price of 365, which is also where SPY is trading right now at this moment. And the expiration date is on the 20th of January 2023. Now for simplicity, let's assume that this is an European option that can only be exercised on the expiry date. And you also have no intention of selling this option off before expiry. Okay, then come 20th of January 2023, SPY's price rose to $400. So that means you can now exercise the option to purchase SPY at $365, which you can then sell at the market for $400 and pocket $35 for each share. And since the option contract is for 100 shares, that means you can profit $3,500 in this transaction. But of course, you don't forget that you also paid $2,262 for the options. So if you net it all outright, you make $1,238 for this particular uh, trade itself. Then from the perspective of the seller, because the event is triggered, you end up, you have to buy, or the seller right, has to go and buy the shares at $400 from the market and then sell it to you for $365. So that means it incur a loss of $3,500. But... At the same time, he also received a premium of $2,262, which he paid to him before this. So if you net it all out, he made a loss of $1,238. So the buyer's profit is the seller's loss and vice versa. Now, using the same example, but this time around, spice priced fold $300 instead. So that represents a drop of $65. Then you, as the option buyer, will of course not want to exercise the call because it doesn't make sense to, right? Why would you want to exercise the option to buy SPY at a higher price than what the market is offering you right now? Remember, you have the right, but not the obligation to do so. Right, so the transaction for this is zero, but since you already paid a premium of $2,262, that represents your loss, right? But the good news is that had you bought a stock instead of the option, you would have lost $6,500 at this point in time. So the use of options here limited your downside to just the premium you paid. Then from the perspective of the option seller, he's very happy because he get to keep all the premium that you paid him right, permanently in his pocket. So far, we've talked about cost. Then what about puts? So let's use back the same example, but this time around, you bought a put on SPY instead because you think the price will fall. And the price did indeed fall. And on the expiration date, SPY fell $65 to $300. So in this case, you will exercise your put. So what you would do is you will purchase SPY at $300 from the market and then sell them to the option seller who has to buy it from you at $365. All right. So your profit per share is $65 per share. And in total, because there are 100 shares on the options contract, you made a total of $6,500 in this particular transaction here. And then after subtracting out the premium you paid, which is $2,262, you make a net profit of $4,238. So on the option seller side, he would have to purchase the shares from you at $365. But that means if he were to sell it in the market now, he would incur the loss of $6,500 in total. And but if you also include in right the premium he actually collected from you, the $2,262, then his net loss is. $4,238.
So what if the price of SPY rose to $400 instead? Then in this case, no event is triggered because you will not exercise your puts because it doesn't make sense to, right? So your loss is simply the premium you paid, right? And the option seller on his end, he'll be celebrating because he gets to keep the premium you paid safely in his pockets. How are options priced? Now, option pricing are somewhat complicated because they're influenced by various different things. But broadly speaking, it comprises of two components, an intrinsic value and an extrinsic value. Now, intrinsic value, right, is the difference between a share price and a strike price, or basically what you can get out of the option when you exercise it. And you will only exercise the option when it makes sense to do so. Right, that is for a call, the share price should be trading above a strike and for a put, the share price should be trading below the strike. Otherwise, you wouldn't be exercising at all, right? Because you wouldn't gain anything out of it. And in those cases, the intrinsic value of the options would be zero. So theoretically, if you think about it, options should be worth at least the intrinsic value. However, in practice, there are situations where an option can trade for less than that due to market inefficiencies. Then what about extrinsic value? So there are a few components to it here. So the first is the time to expiration. Now, as long as the option has not expired, there is a chance for it to breach the strike price. And the longer the duration is, the better the chance. So the longer the duration of an option, the more valuable it is. Now, the second is what we call implied volatility. So you can think of that as a measure on the level of uncertainty in the market. And if the level of uncertainty and fear is high, people will tend to want to buy options for protection and this pushes up the prices. And on the other hand, if let's say the market uncertainty is low, then the demand for the options will not be that high and the prices will come down. Then there is also dividends. So option holders do not hold the shares of the underlying. So they do not get paid any dividends during this period. So if there are any dividend distributions that are paid out by the shares during the life of the option, it has to be discounted off the price itself. And the final one is interest rates. So interest rates affect everything. Options are not spared as well. As a leverage product, options has embedded financing charges within the prices. A higher interest rates tend to increase the price of calls and lower the price of puts slightly and vice versa, all right? And also because of this added extrinsic value, it usually makes more sense for uh, the option buyers to sell the options directly rather than to exercise it. Because when you exercise the option, all you get is only the intrinsic value. Next question, what are options used for? Now options are very popular instruments among speculators who want to bet on the direction and where the prices of the shares will be. Of course, you can also buy or short the shares directly itself, but options do offer some attractive points here. And the first is leverage, because you only have to pay the premium, which is usually a small fraction of the value of the shares you're exposed to. And the second advantage is that with options, your upside is potentially much higher than the downside. Because if your bets turned really ugly, your loss is limited only to the premium you paid. On the contrary, if what you hold are shares in state and it moves drastically against you, you could have lost a lot more. The second use of options is for protection and hedging. Now, most people, including professionals, are what we call long-only investors. So that means they buy securities and hold them in a portfolio. They don't directly short anything. So in a bad market, they may want to hedge their portfolio against adverse price moves. And that is where these people will start to purchase put options on the portfolio and if the prices of their underlying fall then these options will pay off and offset the losses coming from their portfolios itself selling options for income right is another popular strategy particularly among retail investors now most people like the idea of a steady stream of income and if you sell options be cause or puts and if no event is triggered you get to keep the premiums permanently and if you keep selling options regularly you can create something like a regular income but the thing is while the premiums you collect is fixed the loss you can potentially encounter when a share price moves sharply against you triggering an event can be huge and many many times bigger than the premiums you collect what are the risks in options trading now the risk of options are tied to the same factors used in its pricing and i've covered that earlier and within the industry, the different types of risks are actually represented using Greek letters. We have Delta, Gamma, Theta, Vega, and Rho. Okay, but without being too Greeky, 
these are in a nutshell what those risks are or well, the first is the price of the underlying so depending on where the price of the underlying moves it is going to impact the intrinsic value of your options so an option would have certain sensitivities due to the price movements of its underlying all right then the second is time decay so basically time works against an option so as time passes your option can be expected to lose value and once it expires without being exercised it is basically worthless then there is implied volatility which is basically how much uncertainty there is in the market okay and it determines in a way the level of demand for protections or options so the higher the implied volatility the higher the demand and therefore you can expect higher prices for the options and vice versa then there is interest rate and as i mentioned before options being leveraged products have financing charges being built into its pricing and there will be implications right on its prices when interest rates changes right and the last one is leverage so options are leveraged products so it is a double-edged sword yes it amplifies your returns but it can also amplify your losses all right we have come to the last question how to invest in options it is very simple what you need to do is just to open an options trading account and some brokers do offer an integrated account where they can trade many different types of products all in one place. An example is interactive brokers. Okay, but options being a leverage and also more complex products are considered to be riskier than uh, most other assets. So brokers are required to screen your experience before they allow you to trade options. But usually this process is nothing more than just some questionnaire and self-declaration about your own knowledge and experience with the different products, so on and so forth, okay? And after that, once your account is approved, you just simply need to fund it and you can start trading. All right, I've come to the end of the video and thank you for staying with me. I hope you have gained some new knowledge and insights to options, particularly if you're new to it. Now, if you do like this video and find it useful, please do us a favor and hit the like button big time and subscribe to our channel if you have not done so. Do also share this video with your friends and if you have any feedback or questions, feel free to drop it in the comments below. And for your info, we also teach courses at All Quant and if you want to find out more information about it, do drop by our website for the details. You'll find a link to our website in the YouTube description below. Finally, wishing all of you all the best and good trading in this last leg to the year end. Thank you and I'll see you in the next video.